that you're the bread of life and we consume you, never exhaust you. And so here we are, Lord, again, looking at you. Feed us now, Lord, with yourself, bread of life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord praise? Come on, lift your voice. Lift your voice. Wow, what a morning. Go ahead and go back to your seats. You are in for a treat. Eric Gilmore is going to minister to you. <laughs> and... Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I just know it'll be good. Thank you, Upper Room. Do you love Upper Room? Yeah. Family. Thank you. I love y'all. I love, I love you. you. You're so <laughs> wonderful. Oh, man. Well, uh, how many of you have never had the pleasure and privilege of hearing Eric minister Jesus? How many of you have never heard Eric? Okay, you are, you are in for a treat. I feel like um, what Dave and Lou brought, the language, the language uh, was so beautiful and heavenly. I feel like the Lord now is going to begin feeding us with encounter and uh, God really just used Dave and Lou to pave the way for something beautiful. Um, by the way, am I right, Jess, at, two, well, at our next session, we've had to push things back, but the Lord's worth adjusting our schedule. How many of you know our schedule did not die on the cross? Jesus did. I could give a rip about schedules and stupid flow charts as though they change lives. Like, I'm glad our team makes them, but I'm, I'm, I'm better off just burning them. God has the complete liberty to m absolutely destroy our flow chart. If you're a preacher here, a pastor, I, maybe your flow chart's done you well, but give God the liberty to smash that thing in the face. So, Randy is this afternoon, and then we move into Claudio Frizon tonight, and, and Eric, with Eric right now, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit is about to pour himself as oil into your heart. I want you to welcome my dearest friend, a rare Jesus lover, a loyal man, somebody who is possessed with the beauty of the Son of God. I want all of you to stand and welcome Eric Gilmore. Would you do that? So are you guys happy? <laughs> I'm happy. There's something that I like to say before I preach. I say this to the Lord. I say, Lord, make me still enough so that I can hear you. Grant me joy that I may not misrepresent you. And give me sweetness so that you can kiss your people. I have found in my life that it's more important that he has my attention than me knowing what to do. I think that works its way into every area of life. You know, in situations like these, there's a temptation to not be yourself. Do you know what I mean? But I felt like the Lord was saying to me that if I change who I am, then I cannot accomplish the purpose for which he put me right here. And I think that goes for many things in life. 
You're right where you are because you are who you are. I want to encourage you that even in the midst of how heavy things have been, how many of you felt like it's been God is doing a deep work in your life? It has been extremely deep. A, an uprooting seems to be taking place. I almost feel the spark of a revolution. Just in the air, in the, the tenor with Daniel's message that was one of the greatest messages I've ever heard in my life. Dave Papavisi crushing the spirit of fear and then Lou Engle bringing the reality of a, being a dream <laughs> wrapped in a body. I'm telling you, God is doing something tremendous. This feels different than other Jesus conferences, does it not? It feels different, very specific, it seems to be. So I wanna say, first of all, before I get started, I just wanna say that uh, I wanna honor my wife. She's here, babe, I love you. <laughs> My, uh, my parents are here with my, my grandma and my aunt are here. They, you know, my first partners in my ministry, and my, the foundation of my spiritual life. Also, uh, I always feel it's important just to express the gratitude to Michael for an opportunity to have your ears here. I don't take this lightly. It's very important to me to say everything God has said, nothing more, nothing less. So I want to say to Michael, I. I thank you for the opportunity. And like I said the other night, to love him enough to build a house for him is a beautiful thing. And that's what I see with, with what's happening. You guys are bringing it all together. It's wonderful. And you guys know all the, the, the men down here that I run with, I don't know anybody else like them. There is nobody like these guys. Brian Guerin, Dave Papavisi, Daniel Kalinda. I mean, I'm telling you, this is the cream of the crop. And so I'm just honored to be with you guys. I love every one of you. I'd start crying if I say anything more than that. So I'll stop. But I want to say this before, before we get started here. What I'm going to say may seem contrary to things that you have already heard from this pulpit. But I want to assure you it is not. It is rather what lies beneath and what is inside of the heart of every man that you've already heard from, okay? This is important for me to say because I feel I need to present him in the way that he has presented himself to me. I have a deep conviction in my life that I have to present him exactly how he presented himself to me. And so I can only give to you what he has given of himself to me. I feel it's very important to say this because people ask me all the time, why are you so mushy? Why are you so lovey <laughs> when you speak about God? It's because every time he comes to me, he rushes in like a knight in shining armor, rescuing me again and again and again. <laughs> He comes in and he treats me as if I'm the only one because he's so kind and he is full of love. And I'm telling you, he looks at each and every one of you as if there is nobody else. You're a lily among thorns to him. He is captivated with you. And nothing brings his heart more joy than when you're captivated with him too. So I feel in my heart that he's going to strip things away here. So let me pray. <clears throat> I come to you, O oh precious love of mine. Your lips drip with honey and your kisses like wine. Your eyes are so tender and your voice, it's always kind. Your touch is bliss to me. I leave everything else behind. I'm yours, Lord. And you are mine. Because everything in you I find. 
You give flight to the butterflies in my soul. It's you that soothes me and you excite me. You spread joy like rain inside me, Lord, and even when I'm shattered, all of my pieces, they fly to you. You are most lovely to me. And all that I'm asking is that you would open up everybody's ears to hear the sweetness of your tender voice because it cuts and it changes and it builds and it lifts us up to be with you. I worship you. There's a word that's really been in my heart recently. It's the word only. It's such a small word, but it's very exclusive. Only itself means there are no others. And I've been feeling this song even arise in my heart that is saying, only you, Lord, there are no others. I feel as if I'm like Cinderella throughout the day, letting a song go up to the one who's captivated my heart. I can feel it on the inside. I became addicted to the way it feels when I give attention to him. I feel as if the love that he has shown me is of such a kind that it's impossible for me to be the same way that I was before. I feel as if every touch is fulfilling me in a way that nothing else could possibly fulfill me. To say only means that there is not a saint, there's not an angel, there's not a man, there's no one else but you. To say only you, Lord, is to say there's nothing else. It's only you, not a gift, not a promise, not a blessing. It's only you. This is what I desire. And I'm praying that even what begins to happen in your life today is that you'd be in Injected with an only you, God, nothing else, not even the stuff that you give will I allow to take your place. I feel as if to say only you means not even my wife, not even my kids, not even my friends, not even my family, no one comes close to you. You are in a category all by yourself. My heart completely belongs to you. This is the only and I believe this is what he's after here today. He wants an only. I'm telling you right now, most people never experience him as all because they never find him as only. You'll only experience him as all that you need when he's the only thing you want. It's all these additions to him that stop you from being able to experience all of him. <laughs> Oh, to only have him and to only want him. This is it. David writes with his poetic pen in his journal of love, who in the skies is comparable to you, Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like you? You are God, greatly feared in the council of the holy, far above all who surround you. There is no one like you, Lord, none, none, none. And if anything happens to you in this conference, let it be this same love that bursts up unto God that only, only, only desires him and that he's far above even the things that surround him. I'm telling you, God longs to be longed for. He's seeking, he's seeking to be sought. And throughout all of your days, he will be peering into your heart to find out if you still only want just him. With all the things that come to you in your life and all the things that he adds to you by blessing because he's good, he asks you again and again in the core of your heart, do you still only want me? I feel as if the question that is coming out from heaven over this whole room is, God is asking, am I enough for you still? I feel as if his heart is reaching out for each one of us to answer this question with all the truthfulness on the inside. Is God really enough? Just God. I feel it's very important, guys. It's, 
It's going into the motives and the intentions. There's something about when he's enough, he kills competitions, comparisons and frustrations and disappointments and offenses and betrayals and hurts and bitterness and resentment and questions and unbelief. They're all solved with one simple, Lord, you are enough for me, not just now, but for eternity. I desire you, Lord, and only you. There's nothing else. I'm sure that you have found and you will continue to find that every single situation in your life, no matter the nature of it, brings you face to face with whether or not God is still enough for you. You say, Eric, what I'm going through doesn't have anything to do with God. No, everything has to do with God. No, you don't understand. This is about like people are betraying me. People are being harsh towards me or there's situations of sin here. Let me tell you something. Every single one of them will bring you back to face this question. Is God still enough? Is he only? This is what he's longing for. And we search high and low for answers. And his answer is always him. We search high and low for answers, and the answer will always be just himself. Every revelation is just him unfolding himself again. And so you find that you hit these blocks in your life, and when you get there, you're like, I'm in need of a revelation. And then he comes in and he says, it's me. What are you looking for? Well, it's me. If you'll understand who I am, you'll find that you can't find anything outside of me and everything there is is inside of me. God has locked himself up in the person of Jesus Christ so that there's nothing of, of God that is accessible outside of him and everything of God is accessible only in him. God is saying, am I enough? Am I enough for you? Most of our issues are pointing back to the fact that somewhere along the way we've moved past his inexhaustible person. We find ourselves growing when each trial and each resistance brings us back down to him again and again and again. A singular possession. He watches sovereignly over each detail of your life to be let in again as all, again as all. This is what he's looking down from heaven, seeking to and fro throughout the earth, looking for a heart that is completely his. Do you know what a heart that is completely his looks like? It's a heart that has an only you, Lord, written on it. There are no others. There are no others, Lord. It is only you, it has always been only you, and it will always be only you. This is what God is looking for, a heart that is completely his. <clears throat> so we have a choice ever and always before us to let go of all others and have him or hold on to them and have them. It's our choice. He won't force you, he'll wait, hoping that soon enough you'll get tired and remember him. I feel there are people in this room right now. You're tired. And God lets that fatigue set in so that you'll remember one day, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give to you rest. I pray the Lord even now begin to give you rest as you recenter your heart on only Him. See, He peers through the lattice. He reaches His hand in, and anything He can find, He reaches through just to try to arouse your affection for Him again. Remember me, He says, when He puts His hand through. You can't see Him, you can't, He's, he's pushes in, He says, just remember me. 
Because in that turning of attention back to him, the heart gets captivated again and again. You cannot see him and not be taken. So he shows himself to steal your heart away. And he does this again and again. I'm telling you many times, God, he blocks the future from you. He conceals it so you can't see it. And he does this on purpose because he's jealous to have all of your attention. How often men have given attention to God's goals rather than God himself. Many times he'll just block it. And what he's doing and you not being able to see the next step is trying to make you come face to face with whether or not he is still enough for you. I'm telling you, this is the word of the Lord. He's jealous for all your attention. He will not share it. He will not even share it with things that he has promised to you. Many men have cheated on God with stuff God gave them. It's a problem. And only you is what we need. I ask you today to let the Holy Spirit deeply search your heart and ask you this question, is God still enough? Or do you want something from him? Or are you wanting him to do something? <laughs> you see, there's a, something that intrigues me in history, and it is the relationship we see in the scriptures between God and his man, or a man and his God. Nothing moves me quite like this. I mean, we have Abraham as a friend of God. We have Job is said by God to be like nobody else on the earth. Moses spoke to God face to face. Daniel was called a man greatly loved, and John was called the beloved. But there is a unique description, a description that moves me more than all the other ones. And it is what is said of King David. He was a man after God's own heart. See, a man's life can be summed up in a book, maybe two books. But David's whole life, all that he did, all that he accomplished was summed up in this statement. He was a man after God's own heart. Literally a man who longed for God, a man who longed for God only. A man whose journal reads, my soul pines for you. Literally my entire being is aching for you. A man whose sweet, intimate love exchange with God, he writes in his journal again, my soul pants for you, an audible craving hunger for his God. I want you so bad, God. It's coming out of my sound. I remember reading of John G. Lake. He felt he was so hungry for God, he would scream out on the street, Oh, just so hungry for God, the ache would rise up on the inside. David has this same lover's ache. I'm telling you, backsliding is when your heart stops aching for Jesus. David writes, my soul thirsts for you, literally, all of me needs all of you to satisfy everything inside of me. This is what David is saying. So his heart was so taken with God that many times his logic seemed to be suspended. What do you mean? It's as if he was so wrapped in his God and so transfixed with his God that he was unable to be affected by people or the actual situation that he found himself in. What do you mean? Well, he says, these people seek my life, or men seek my life, but I am in love with your words. He seems to be so preoccupied. He doesn't deny that things are going on, but his preoccupation with words that he calls sweeter than honey has captivated all his attention. Maybe people speak deeply about you, try to frame you, say bad things about you. I'm telling you that when God's words have captivated your heart, you've seen that they are sweeter than honey. There's something about the sweetness of the honey that comes from his lips that takes away all the bitterness that comes from other people's lips. Just to listen to him, to hear him. 
You see, David seemed to be unable to hold his attention on what was immediately going on right in front of him because of the beauty of the Lord. In David, God had found a man who was all his. David is a man who finds God as all things because God was the only thing that he wanted. As A.W. Tozer said, when a man has met God, he's not looking for anything because he has found it. It's the secret, guys. David pens again in his journal. He says, I have no one else but you. I desire nothing but you. This is only, this is the only you, Lord. He's penning it out right here. God was the only thing David wanted, and David was called the man who wanted God's heart. I'm telling you, the entirety of this man wanted the entirety of God. You may ask, what does it actually mean to be a man after God's own heart? Well, I'll go through, through it really quickly. I think looking into the origin of the statement, a man after God's own heart, will reveal to us exactly what it is. Once upon a time, there was a man named Saul. And this guy Saul, 1 Samuel 10, 1 says that God kissed his life, literally anointed his life through his prophet Samuel. In chapter 10, verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him. He speaks for God. He's changed into another man. Verse 7 says God was with him. Verse 9 says he was supernaturally endowed. He had signs and wonders, a changed heart. He was in line with the Word of God. Verse 10 says the Spirit of God came upon him and the, all the people took notice of it. There was once a man named Saul, and it seemed like he was God's man. God seemed to be publicly endorsing him. All the people came around him. 1 Samuel 10, 16, Saul doesn't even speak against people that speak against him. He literally doesn't even tell people about his position before God or the power of God. It seems like Saul is humble. Saul, who had been touched by God, he refused to promote himself. And verse 21, Saul is hiding from the exaltation as, as king. You see, Saul looks like he's God's man. Verse 24, the Lord had chosen him and he stood out not just physically, but he also stood out among the people. Verse 26, valiant men from all over came and they, they supported him. They rallied around him to follow him and to serve him. And verse, 20, and verse 6 and 11 of chapter 11, the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily to deliver the people. Saul stood up in front of everyone as God's seeming man. In verse 15, Saul is exalted by the people with an undeniable anointing and a demonstration of God's power that's on his life. Are you seeing what I'm put, painting for you? Saul looks like he's God's man. The glory of God seemed to be on him. God was accomplishing his purposes through him. Verse 13, chapter 13, verse 4, news about Saul spread everywhere. God has a man, God has a man. It's going out everywhere. God's got his spirit on, side of, on a man. He's going to be king. He's God's extension in the earth. This is God's guy. And then verse 5 of chapter 13 comes, where a host encamps against him. And this is where Saul changes. A host encamps against him. My friends, this is pressure. An army ten times the size of his own, physical weapons surrounding him. All the people are looking at him. There's commotion. He's surrounded. Everyone looks, Saul, what do we do? This is pressure. And what you do when God is silent is the greatest exposing of what really has your affection and your attention. Saul's looking around, God's nowhere. The word of the Lord has not arrived. He knows he's supposed to wait, but pressure has a way about it. It makes you start thinking about other things. So under pressure, Saul could only see his present situation. Did you hear that? Under pressure, Saul could only see what was right in front of him. So many people cry to God for deliverance. 
in Hosea, God says, my people cry out to me, but they will not adore me. I'm telling you right now, many times, it is the deliverance men seek and not God. Saul waited for a little while until he saw deliverance was not coming, which shows us that Saul wasn't waiting for God ever. He wasn't attentive to God at all. He was thinking about the deliverance of his situation. In other words, what Saul is testifying by not waiting is, God, you are not enough for me. I want something from thee. Are you understanding? So, people want to be instantaneously delivered out of everything because they don't want to have to be dependent upon God every day. Are you hearing me? This happens a lot because you have to keep coming face to face with the reality of whether or not God is really enough for you. But to bring it down, we see that Saul did not look to the Lord. God let this host encamp against him to expose the fact that it was not God that he wanted. He had something else in his heart. Saul's attention was elsewhere. His desires were for other things. To only want God means the exclusion of all other things. This is what waiting really is. It is sustained exclusion. I'm continuing to look unto you. Waiting means you realize that you are unable to do anything yourself. Attentiveness to God and holding it there means I refuse to empower myself. It's important to understand that waiting is not power in and of itself. The power lies in the one who has your attention. Waiting is not about waiting. Waiting is about who are you looking at. Saul waited for a little while, but his waiting was ne not looking at God. It was wanting deliverance. Saul waited for deliverance, but God did not have his attention. Choosing not to be attentive to God is self-sufficiency. Nothing is as opposed to God as self-sufficiency. <laughs> Only God's enemies are not dependent upon him. Saul's impatience was ultimately an act of independence from God. Maybe Saul was disappointed in God. God didn't do something the way that he thought it should be done. Maybe he was disappointed with God because God didn't do it when he thought he should do it. No matter the reason, it doesn't matter because what Saul was doing was making a statement, you are not enough for me. I'm looking for something else from you. How many know that our lives testify more truly than what we say with our mouths? <laughs> but to wait, to be actually attentive to God is to testify to God, you are enough for me. Pressure or persecution or people, come what may, for you I wait all the day. Nothing else has my attention, Lord, I only want you. When God is enough, we're emptied of these ulterior motives, these personal ambitions, these selfish intentions, our own devices and our own desires. It means God is all that matters. Mother Besselia Schlink wrote, you are here, what more could I want? I'm trying to get to the heart of the issue, guys. You can go lay down your life in some other country, but I'm telling you, even if you give your body to be burned and you don't love Jesus first, it's worthless. It has to come from a heart that is captivated with his person and not some fascination with our own legacy. I'm telling you guys, Brother Lawrence said this, he said, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm so serene, it doesn't even matter. There's a holy complacency, my friends. Complacency is a bad word in Christianity, but there's a holy complacency. You wanna know what it looks like? It means to have him is to have everything already. 
What does it mean? It means place me wherever you wish, take me wherever you wish, say whatever you wish, I'll do whatever you wish because as long as I have you, I have everything. You take everything from me and give me God, I've got everything. You give me God and give me everything, I've got nothing. I don't know if I said that right, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Saul was weighed down by his own ambitions, his own determinations, his expectations, his reputation, <laughs> his need for explanations, the wonderful pressure of keeping all your attention on God is home to some and misery to others. Waiting strips you down to naked trust. Waiting strips you down to naked trust. It reduces you to Him only. It is the true love that excludes everything else and left only with Him. Men do not acquire faith. They're reduced to it. What do you mean? You can't just say, I'm gonna go get faith. No, you gotta be stripped down to only Him again and again and again. I'm telling you, it's very important because in the midst of spiritualities, we've got all these things that sneak their way in like angels of light. They present themselves on the outside like very spiritual things, but in the heart of it, Jesus is not there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's very common, especially in the circles that are very fiery. <laughs> we must be reduced to Him only. The other things that lay hidden in Saul's heart were exposed the moment that it was important that God was the only thing that he wanted. You will come to this moment. Many of you have come to it already and you will come to it again because life is one endless face to face with is God really enough for me? And I cannot say truthfully, God is all I want until he's all I've got. What does that mean, Eric? Listen, you can choose this stripping. It's called love. What do you mean, Eric, it's called love? Have you ever seen somebody get married? I remember we were at a wedding, Brooke and I. It wasn't ours, it was somebody else's. And the minister said to the two getting married, he said, forsaking all others, keeping only to thee. And the words came out and went through me and I felt as if God was saying, marry me. Forsake all others, everything else, and keep only to me. God is looking for a man that he can take near to himself. How blessed is the man that God draws near to himself. Oh, to want him, to desire him, to be satisfied with him above all things. This is life itself. You don't live until he has all of your life. And it starts with the heart. And you see, we weren't created for our spouses. We were not created for children or jobs or achievements or spiritual blessings. We were created for Him and Him and Him alone. For Him to have all the heart is what He's been after from the very beginning. You see, Saul couldn't experience God as all because he didn't want God only. This is evident by choosing to force something to happen. When God stood still, he made it work. This means you're not interested in God. You're interested in a result, an outcome, an accomplishment. What you, if, you keep, if you keep walking when God stands still, it means God does not have all your attention. Many times God walks with you like this and then he just stops just to see if you'll keep going. To see if your eyes are more on the goal than on him who's with you. I told you at the very beginning, it's more important that God has all your attention than you knowing what's coming. Because it means he has your heart. You see, Saul got antsy in 13, 9 through 12. Saul gets antsy. 
Listen to me. Antiness is getting out of sync with God. Saul begins to fear the people. And this is what happens when your heart is not captivated with God. He was more aware of the people's presence than God's presence. Saul, man, God must be more valuable to us than our own name. But Saul was thinking of his own name and his own game that he was running. And he forgot about God. Saul was intoxicated with his own legacy. He forced himself to sacrifice to the Lord without the Lord. Did you hear this? Side note, that's religion. Service to the Lord without eyes locked with the Lord. That's religion. This will kill you. Even the right thing without God is evil. With his presence, everything is right. Without his presence, everything is wrong. Ungodliness is everything that does not have the divine stamp on it. The stamp of God's origin. Did you hear it from him? Did it come from relationship or were you inspired by somebody else? No. Saul seeks to save his face because the more he waited, the less chance he saw for a victory. He was losing people. He was losing followers. He sought to save his face. We seek to save our face when we can't see the Savior's face. <laughs> That's what we do. See, we always seek to have our eyes on ourselves some, for some reason. Keith Green said, it's so hard to see when my eyes are on me. But when God has all your attention, the next verse in 13, 13, Samuel sums up Saul's whole behavior with one word. He says, this is foolishness. You're a fool for not giving God all your attention. And the very next verse, Samuel makes the statement, God has sought out for himself a man after his own heart. There's the origin of it. Saul anointed, touched, used, exalted, and all the while, while Saul was being looked at by all the people, he had all the attention in public, David had God's attention in private. God had already sought out somebody who no one else could see. See, Scripture would suggest to us that while Saul's heart rose in pride in public, David bowed low in private. See, God raises up those who are bowed down because when you're bowed down, you lose all desire to ever be raised up at all. And this is the kind of thing that God loves. He's attracted to humility like this. In context to the statement, a man after God's own heart, God had found for himself a man after his own heart in this way. One to whom God was enough. One who loved God enough to look at him. One who loved God enough to wait for him. One who loved God enough to be stripped down to naked trust. Such nakedness is an invitation for which God unendingly waits. To be stripped down to nothing invites God to be all. The nakedness of only wanting him. The scripture would suggest to us that David was plucking the strings of God's heart when no man could see. <laughs> Saul had the people's attention, but David had God's attention. Leonard Ravenhill's quote would fit perfect right here. What does it matter if you have the frown of men, if you have the smile of God? And if you have the smile of, of men, what does it matter if you have the frown of God? Do you understand? Yeah. God's heart was drawn to the melodies of love rising from the heart of an underage shepherd boy beside still waters and laying in green pastures. 1 Samuel 15, 28, God says, I have found someone better than Saul. Did you hear this language? David is better than Saul because Saul denied the Lord when a host encamped against him. 
But do you want to know what David did when a host encamped against him? He's in the very same situation that Saul was in when he would not wait for the Lord. David says, though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. And though war rise against me, in this I will be confident there is only one thing that I have desired and one thing that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. He's so mesmerized, his logic seems to be suspended. War is around him. And you look at David, what are we going to do? We're outnumbered. We're going to die. And David says, I'm confident. What are you confident in? Do you have another army? No, there's only one thing I want. And it's his presence. There's only one thing that I desire, and it's to behold him. <laughs> David, is, David is like few. You see... It's like David says, they see me, but I see you. Things in life are against me, but I'm laying on you. I don't know if you've ever actually taken time to strip everything down and just simply sit with God, but if you have, you recognize something about him. All he's interested in, in doing is holding you, hold you close. You see, David's confidence is incredible, but it's not logical. <laughs> Weapons, armies, war, I'm not worried. I only want the Lord, he says. Verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 12, Saul wants another chance, and he partially obeys. Then he sets up a monument to himself. You see, partial obedience is just before self-exaltation. We see that Saul's heart was not captiv captivated by God. He wanted other things. He was out for his own name, his own kingdom, his independence. He was riddled with fear and unrest and patience and disobedience. All was rooted in the pride that simply would not yield to God stripping everything down to just him. Oh, how pride withers men into snakes, turns angels into devils. Pride is the denial of God, the invention of the devil, the mother of condemnation. It's flight from God's help, the gateway to hypocrisy, the fortress of devils, the source of hard-heartedness, the denial of compassion, the root of blasphemy, the exaltation of self-efforts, the spurning of God's help. It's the custodian of all sins. Pride will destroy you. But as Andrew Murray said, there's nothing more humble than adoring Jesus. It puts you in your place where you belong and puts him in his. I'm finishing right here. So Saul knows that he's disobeyed, but he begins to present himself outwardly like he's been obedient. So Samuel teaches him. Do you think that the Lord enjoys your religious practices or obedience to his voice? Saul put practices over God's person. He let the means of worship eclipse the object of worship. Saul's love was really a love of himself. This is the root of every single addition to God. We still, in some way, have a love for ourselves that we won't relinquish to him and let him strip away. A love that forsakes all and keeps only to him. 1 Samuel 15, 24, Saul is exposed and he confesses. And then he tells the reason for his disobedience. He says it's that he feared the people and he listened to men. Fear is self-absorption. <laughs> That's what it is. We will always eclipse God's voice with man's when we choose logic over listening to God. I pray the Lord reduce us. Reduce us down to him alone. We cannot refuse this reduction. We cannot. We have to let him take us back down to only him. We must be willing to volunteer for such nakedness. Not only is it the state of experiential bliss, but it's also the safest place there is. We must be a people radically committed to the all-sufficiency of Jesus because every addition is a subtraction from him. It's important to note that 
David having witnessed the dissolve of Saul, because remember he was brought in to play for him when he was going crazy, having witnessed the rejection of Saul because of wanting other things, having witnessed the rejection, the destruction, the dissolving of Saul through impatient disobedience, David writes with deep conviction, wait on the Lord. <laughs> I've seen what it does when you don't Give God all of your attention and subject your life to loving Him and wanting Him and letting Him be enough for you. I can see it in this crazy man throwing spears at me. <laughs> so he says, wait on the Lord. Yes, I say, wait upon the Lord. We must accept in our hearts that God does not want our help. He wants our surrender. He's not looking for elves to do his will, he's looking for conduits through which he can flow. We must learn that prayer is better than performance. Waiting is better than work. Rest is better than running. Yielding is better than wielding. Receiving is better than retrieving. Why? Because it's in this rest, in this waiting that you receive God's power. And the only thing that pleases God is what God does himself. So you receive God and God does the thing himself. Here we accept in this waiting place, we accept the frightening inadequacy to affect God's will at all or even to keep from trying to do so. We must be reduced to the embarrassing level of simply and only having nothing but God. This is the beauty. In that place, God has no obstacle. And I'll close right here. John is gonna sing a song in a second that I believe the Lord told me to have him sing over you. But do you remember the story of Jacob and Rachel? Jacob sees Rachel, she's beautiful, he wants her. So he goes to her dad, I want her. Leban says, all right, I'll give her to you. Seven years of working to be able to gain her. He says, okay. The Bible says that he loved her so much that that seven years was like a few days. There's something about love that makes easy the things others pain and disciplines. There's something about love that performs a work through you instead of a work that you do. There's something about love that links you with the reality of who and what God is really after, as opposed to just trying to make something work. And the wonderful thing about this story is that he's tricked by his father-in-law and he's given Leah instead of Rachel. So now he's got the wrong girl and he goes back, you tricked me. His, the dad says, Give me seven more years and I'll give her to you. He loves her so much that he says, okay. He loved her so much that he did not have a contentment with just being married or having something like Rachel in her sister. He wanted exactly Rachel. And I'm telling you, when you love Jesus with all of your heart, you will wait for him because you'll say, it doesn't matter if it looks like you, it doesn't matter if it sounds like you, if it's not exactly you, I'm not interested. I only want you even if I have to wait 14 years from it. This is what I want. I want you above all things. You are enough for me. I can see, I can see Rachel looking into the eyes of Jacob saying, thank you for loving me enough to wait for me. And I can see Jacob's love so deep, looking into the eyes of Rachel saying, time itself couldn't dampen my love for you. This is the kind of love exchange that God wants with you. To be able to say, time itself, Lord, could not dampen my love for you. And God's saying, thank you for loving me enough to wait for me. I pray, oh God, I pray. Strip us down, God, to naked trust, Lord. God, go into the motives and the intentions 
and bring us back to your feet where we can say, you are more than enough for me. I have you, I have all, you're, you're everything to me. Just right where you are, just begin to let your heart look at him. Just look at him, just say, oh God, I give you all my attention. There's no one like you. Just to be with you again And I'm no longer tied To what can't satisfy Strip it all away Strip it all away All that tries to steal my heart's affection don't need it anyway if it leads my eyes astray cause only you deserve all of my attention so strip it all away Strip it all away, strip it all away, all that tries to steal my heart's affection, I don't need it anyway, if it leads my eyes astray, cause only you deserve
I was watching uh, Danielle Papavisi on her knees, trying to give more to the Lord. And they've left everything to move their family and their life to walk with Jesus in Iraq, and there she is, wanting to give him more. Father, we have nothing to give but us. <laughs> this insufficient as that is, you want it still, so here we are, Lord. Stains and all. Be everything to us, Lord. Take us. Have us. Go deep now into the motives of our heart. Pierce us with the spear of love. Thank you, Lord. I love you. There's always more to give him. It's us he wants. I just want to encourage you to give yourself over right now, whatever that looks like to you, however the Holy Spirit is prompting you to give yourself over. Just do that. Thank you, Lord. I love you. Faithful love has won me over. You've become my everything. I've never known a greater love. So take this life, my own. Cheers. 